very good morning and good afternoon to all of you. Uh, my name is Somati Banerjee. On behalf of Sankal Global Summit and CIR Conclave 2020, uh, I welcome all of you to our session, The Role of Policy in Enabling and Accelerating the Transition of the Textile and Apparel Industry Towards Circularity in the Global South. It is my privilege to introduce our esteemed panel for the session. The panel will be moderated by uh, Rijit Sengupta, who's the CEO of Center for Responsible Business in India. Uh, Dr. Rubana Haq, who's the president of Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Exporters Association, BGMEA. Uh, and uh, Divya Dutt, who's the program management officer at the UN Environment Program. Dr. Kwan, uh, director of Institute of Circular Economy Development, Vietnam. We have uh, Antonia Tesha, uh, who's the industry director of textile and apparel at Missingi East, East Africa. We have Sharika Senanayake, who's the Director of Environmental Sustainability, MAS Holding Sri Lanka. And we have uh, uh, Ms. Karen Boomsma, who's the Project Director at uh, Sustainable Inclusive Business, which is, you know, uh, which is a uh, run out at, at uh, Kenya Private Sector Alliance, KEPSA. We, we uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, Dr. Peter Mathuki, who's the executive director and CEO of East African Business Council, is you know un unable to join us. However, we have uh, we will have Geoffrey Kamanzi uh, from the EABC who will you know kind of join uh, and speak on behalf of Dr. Peter Mathuki. Just to set a little bit of a context uh, before I hand over and uh, hand over the session to session proceedings to Rijit. <clears throat> the relevance and potential of the industry, uh, which is we, in our in our context, is the textile and apparel industry. Uh, the relevance of this industry to contribute to the economies in the global south is immense. Valued at 140 billion US dollars, the industry in India, for example, accounts for about 7% of the country's GDP and generates exports worth 36 billion US dollars. The sector employs about 45 million people directly and 60 million people indirectly. In addition to being production hubs, the advent of fast fashion and the growth of domestic consumption has attracted the entry of international brands, transforming countries like India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka into important global consumption hubs also. Countries in East Africa, on the other hand, exhibit significant potential for infusing circular economy principles into their textile, industry policies and in turn their international trade policies given their significant exposure to imports uh, despite its economic significance however the sector is characterized by a range of systemic challenges it is one of the biggest contributors to environmental pollution given its dependence on the traditional linear take make dispose economic model it is plagued with challenges associated with inefficient production processes and resource utilization, a highly fragmented structure and low productivity. The systemic issues have left the sector all the more vulnerable to the debilitating effects of COVID crisis in the form of widespread loss of lives and livelihoods and erosion of trust amongst industry stakeholders. Addressing these systemic sectoral challenges calls for a paradigm shift in thinking from the traditional linear economic model to a more circular economy based model. South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Africa have been at the center of the, this evolving discourse around circular economy. As we envision a circular textile and apparel industry, policy is bound to play a significant role in enabling the adoption of circular practices across these regions. Furthermore, there is tremendous scope for these countries in these regions to learn from and collaborate with each other and strengthen policy linkages amongst them. I will briefly introduce the four session goals that we have for this session. Number one, to take stock of the current state of policy thinking with respect to circular economy in each of the countries and regions represented by our esteemed speakers, particularly with respect to the textile and apparel sector. Number two, to discuss the challenges and priorities with respect to the transition of the sector at the country and the regional level that need enabling policy support and interventions. Goal number three, to identify required policy interventions, both short to medium term, as well as in the long term, at the country and the regional level to address the challenges and priorities we are able to identify in the session. Finally, very organically, the fourth goal we want to reach is to surface lessons that countries in the global south can learn from each other with respect to circular policy formulation and action in the context of textile and apparel sector. 
before I hand before I hand over the se session proceedings to Rijit, I would just request all the participants to feel free to kind of uh, uh, post your questions on the chat box. And towards the end of the session, uh, we will be taking some of these questions directed to our speakers. Thank you so much again for joining us. Over to you, Rijit. Thanks a lot, uh, Somatish, and thanks to uh, Somatish and to Venkat and, and Stephanie uh, for uh, inviting the Center for Responsible Business uh, to be part of this very important conversation. Um, the Center for Responsible Business, uh, as uh, Somatish kindly introduced, is a think tank which works on responsible business issues in India and beyond. Um, and this is, a, this is a very, very important conversation according to, uh, you know, according to us, the initiated, and we feel that, uh, and we hope that the, this conversation continues um, to be uh, to be had beyond these 90 minutes that we uh, that we have uh, today for having this uh, for having for, for really starting this conversation. Um, and it is critical that we um, that we have this conversation um, because, as Somatish also uh, alluded to. Uh, COVID has really highlighted that it cannot be business as usual. Um, and not only that it cannot be business as usual anymore, um, it has also highlighted, and, I, and we hope um, that it is also showing us that we also need to come out of our own comfort zone, uh, of our own comfort zones of how, we've, um, of how we have thought about things and how we've conducted ourselves. Uh, in in, uh, in in developing a world um, and and doing justice to our future generations, we haven't really done that. Um, so so we have to come out of our. Uh, uh, so there is this Im imperative for us to come out of our comfort zones. It cannot be bus business as usual. And at the same time, uh, we will also and we are seeing across that there is a there is tightening of uh, of everything. You know whether it is. Uh, tightening of uh, resources uh, available, which were earlier available, might not be available to us. Uh, tightening of financials, uh, which were earlier available, might not be available to us. Tightening of regulations, and even tightening of the the ability of consumers to spend. So these are the new realities that you know we will have to start thinking and doing things um, coming out of our uh, of our. Uh, comfort zone and and really uh, you know and really uh, admitting that uh, and and realizing that it cannot be uh, business as usual and in and in this context we feel uh, uh, that uh, the principles of circular economy provides us some ideas or some support uh, to take this to take our action and, and design our, our thinking going forward. Um, there is really no, uh, there is no, there's no argument uh, anymore, uh, whether at the highest international political level, which is the, uh, you know, the United Nations General Assembly, and we had the 75th uh, session of the United Nations General Assembly a few weeks ago, um, and circular economy and the importance of circular economy has also been highlighted at the topmost international policy level. Um, from there, even at the level of the countries, many policymakers, politicians are now uh, subscribed to the idea of, uh, of the importance of circular economy and the principles of circular economy. So there is really a growing understanding about uh, or realization really of uh, the importance of circular economy going forward. And from the work that we've done, uh, we see that there's a, there's a clear continuum uh, of understanding, immersion, and, and actions that, uh, that is, that is becoming uh, more and more clear. Uh, when it comes to understanding, the first is about understanding what we mean about circular economy. You know, um, and this understanding has to be developed jointly, uh, not only by the international community or the advanced economies, but also by the, the suppliers, the civil society organizations, the, the local uh, uh, governments, et cetera. So it has to be a combination of an understanding, uh, uh, a shared understanding of what we mean by circular economy. 
The second is about the immersion. So once we have understood the elements of circular economy, especially for a particular sector or, or, or an area, then to figure out how can we immerse that into our, our uh, national or regional systems. Um, and there, uh, the importance of policy is critical. And we will be uh, talking, and we have a fantastic panel here today, thanks to, uh, thanks to IntelliCap, and we will talk about that, that element of immersion uh, into national policies. And the third is action. You know, how do you, uh, once you, once you immerse uh, into the national system, what are, what are those criteria that you choose to initiate actions, identify those priorities? And again, that is also something that we'll be talking about. So uh, these are very, very interesting uh, sort of conversations. And as I said, I, you know, we really hope that uh, the conversation will not only uh, remain restricted to conversation, but we will also start to take some, some actions going forward. Uh, very quickly, in, 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 in about a minute, I would also like to touch upon some of the critical areas that have uh, emerged from our own work uh, together with uh, IntelliCAP and, and CAF on uh, circular economy issues in the, in the apparel and textile sector in India. Uh, we, there are about six or seven issues that have emerged uh, from our uh, from our uh, interventions, and the first again is about this whole uh, creating a consistent understanding and a standardized understanding of what we mean by circular economy. The second is about the need for boosting investments in R and D and really creating uh, an R and D movement uh, in in um, in the apparel and textile sector was um, aligned with innovation. The third is to really look very closely at the role of the government. Is the role of the government only restricted to policy making, or can the government also play a role as an active economic player to public procurement? The fourth is about skills and the importance of creating skills which probably are not there today, but that need to be created. And here the importance of creating uh, interesting relations between the local academic institutions and the industry. You know, you don't have to look at international uh, you know, universities, local universities, local uh, training institutions, can they meet the demand of the industry? Fourth is about, uh, about uh, jobs. You know, there, there are uh, the way uh, circular economy is being looked at and uh, hopefully will be, uh, is already being uh, operationalized, this will also lead to creation of jobs which are not there today. Um, so we will have this, this is, uh, there is great potential in, 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 in circular economy, in meeting some of these. And if you look at these issues, these are very, very important issues uh, from, uh, from our understanding of how we should move forward. And uh, with that, let me uh, invite our panelists to uh, share their thoughts. Um, I'll, I'll stop here uh, with my opening uh, remarks. And the first question that we uh, would like to talk about is about, uh, as, as Somatish uh, uh, told us, um, what is the current state of policy thinking in the, with, with respect to circular economy? And, um, and our, 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 our idea would be to ask our esteemed panelists to share their thoughts uh, more broadly, if you like, or if you want to share your thoughts more specifically about the apparel and textile sector, uh, feel free to do so. So if I may kindly uh, ask uh, Karen, uh, Karen Bumsma from uh, KEPSA, Kenyan Private Sector Association. Uh, Karen, the floor is yours. You've got about three minutes to share your thoughts on the, on the policy thinking regard to circular economy. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to share a, a view specifically on Kenya, but also the region. Um, so thank you for that. I think uh, it's a very, very um, important sector that we have to talk uh, uh, about the opportunity areas for circular economy, because basically this industry touches upon all the elements and, and there are all um, a very big components of actually negative impact, both on the side of the environment as well as on uh, inclusivity. On the other hand, where the issues are, there lies also a lot of opportunity. So if we do it well, this is a very big sector. 
And so how can we now make sure that actually fast fashion is being tackled in a manner that is uh, good for the people and good for planet? Because that's one thing that we have so much production and how we produce. Um, those are uh, very key. If we don't change that, we have a negative impact um, on our resources, uh, on our energy use, but also uh, on people. Um, and we actually increase inequality. So for me, it's uh, what we look at in Kenya, we see opportunity areas. Most of the time we start from the waste perspective. At the moment in Kenya, the textile and apparel industry is not massive. Um, we are lacking behind in technologies. Uh, they are very old fashioned and we do way less than any other country. I think it's like 0.7% of what Bangladesh is producing and uh, contributing to the industry, for instance. Um, on the other hand, that for Kenya brings opportunities because we are able to tap into green, um, uh, green textile industry because the demand from consumers is, is really increasing on that. So we would be able to actually, when we invest in new techniques and uh, machines, we can do that straight away with, uh, with greener uh, machinery and greener technologies and innovations. And that demand will rise. And there is an opportunity for Kenya and for East Africa in general to tap into um, organically produced uh, cotton, but also the whole apparel um, uh, part of the textile industry um, can really benefit from that awareness and the need from the consumers to be green. Um, the other thing is that we can tap into smaller um, uh, demands because we do have a lot of the fast, fast fashion, which is obviously depending on cheap labor, uh, cheap energy and cheap production. Um, but there is also an increase in smaller production lines, uh, a niche market, um, special fashion, not fast fashion, special fashion. Uh, and there is the opportunity for Kenya as well to, to tap into. For us, the biggest challenges are, for instance, electricity costs. So uh, almost 25% of production cost is uh, electricity because it's really expensive. Uh, what we could have a look at um, in Kenya, we have uh, a policy where we support actually the big four. So four areas where the, the government wants to really make an effort in improving, which is housing, affordable housing, it's health, so health access, uh, but also manufacturing. And in that, um, we should do that sustainably. So for, for me, um, we do raise awareness within uh, the private sector amongst the concepts of redesigning. So what kind of materials are you using for what? What kind of materials can you reuse and recycle? So those are aspects what we're looking at in our region and with our private sector. Uh, how can you tap into renewable energy instead of, of fossil fuels? And also how can you apply innovations that actually allow you to um, make sure that one input becomes an output and an input again. So really going back into fiber to fiber recycling and that we see more and more. So for us, the discussion here has started also um, along the lines of general waste streams and plastics in particularly with a single use plastic bin, with a plastic bag bin. Um, and there actually we opened up the discussion on what can you actually do with those materials? How can you recover them? How can you avoid them ending up in landfills? And the same counts with textile. 90% uh, of the textile still ends up at the landfill and only 10% is being recycled. And yet we have the most the biggest uh, second-hand clothing industry. So that's another aspect. We create fast fashion, which mainly goes to the US and comes back to us as second-hand markets. So how do we balance those markets? Because they are actually um, not encouraging each other. And we do have too much because even in, in Kenya, we don't recycle more than 10% of those uh, second-hand clothing. And yes, there is a market for the secondhand clothing, so that's, but that doesn't weigh up to the, the jobs you could provide with sustainable and circular textile industry. Sure. So that would, that's my uh, small view on the situation here.
Well, in your small view, you raised very, very big issues, and uh, and I'm sure some of the other uh, colleagues will. And and since you've talked very specifically about textiles, maybe uh, we'll bring in, uh, we'll you know turn the order around a little, and we'll bring in uh, Dr. Rubana Haq from BGMEA, uh, Bangladesh uh, Garments Manufacturers Association. Uh, uh, Dr. Haq, if you can, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, very pleased to uh, uh, have you here and your experience. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Bangladesh, about how um, a transition to a circular economy uh, is or will um, be supported by Bangladesh going forward? And what are the signs that you see uh, from your experience? So, over to you. Um, I mean, uh, on the topic of, thank you very much for inviting me to the panel. It's, it's a rare pleasure and an honor. Um, <clears throat> I mean, we're talking about circularity uh, at a time when we think we should go circular plus. Um, we're talking about circularity at this point of time from a very clinical point of view. I think the, I'm sure the other uh, panelists will also agree that because of COVID, we have come to a, such a point that we don't know what circularity should be all about. It's just not about the process. It's just not about the concept of circularity. Unless, you know, it's great to talk about um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions being an integral part of uh, our commitment, but I think what, what needs to be also driven home is whether we are supporting um, sustainable livelihood. So it's important for us to understand that we will not talk about just circularity in economy, but we will be talking about circularity in livelihood. Um, and sustainable livelihoods uh, is a concept which is talked about quite a lot, but um, nobody actually gets to the bottom of it. And uh, like the other panelists just mentioned that we have too much and uh, that, you know, secondhand is an option. Yes, we have too much. And then again, even then we go for buy one, get one free. So there is a conflict in, in the uh, in the band of consumerism, which needs to be corrected. Um, so if you are buying one and getting the other one free, automatically we are the ones, the corporate sector, the, um, we are actually encouraging that excessive consumption. But at the same time, have we done anything to turn the discourse around? Have we done anything to say, hey, you know what, I'm going to restructure my business and I'm going to uh, downsize and yet I will scale it up because quantity and quality are, are two, two, um, two words which, which don't go hand in hand in terms of Bangladesh. We are still uh, producing five basic products. I mean, yes, we are doing value-added products as well, but there is no marketing for that because we have so far not been able to bring forward a simple uh, uh, logic to the table, and that is um, what we are doing, is it actually benefiting the, the workers and the entire economy? It is, it is helping the economy, but are we, are we now in a position to tell our buyers that why don't you, at this point of time, uh, think about paying us a little more for the beautiful products that we produce? How about just acknowledging that we need to have green prices? How about just not saying that, you know, we want circularity in fashion industry and yet, and come out with huge big fashion agendas. Uh, and, and there's just so many, so many projects. We're suffering from a project fatigue, but nobody is at this point committing to paying uh, a sustainable price to the industry. So where does the circularity come in in a country like Bangladesh, where we are uh, not really in a position to even uh, assess our waste uh, properly. Are we actually tracking waste? Are we being able to incentivize um, waste reduction? Are we giving tax cuts to whoever is uh, investing in, in circularity? Not yet. I mean, yes, there's a lot of talk about uh, encouraging green production, green growth. And you know what? We have more than 500 factories, which are just waiting to be certified, LEED certified. And we have uh, the, the best, 50% of the world's best green factories are in Bangladesh. But where is that discourse? Where is that conversation? That's not happening. So 
I will give you a small example about uh, policy hiccups that we have. A uh, couple of months ago, a Swedish um, uh, company contacted me and said, you know what, we are trying to uh, bring in a lot of uh, Swedish bed sheets from five star hotels and we want you to turn them into bags. Uh, so I have been fighting with <laughs> the policymakers, uh, trying to tell them that, you know, treat that uh, material, which is actually sitting in the port as a raw material for making the bags. But the concept of raw material, the finished goods being a, being a raw material, it's just not there. I mean, everybody just keeps on thinking that, you know, there is some kind of a conspiracy there and then, you know, it's going to be not going to be used for that. So we need to the policymakers and the industry in every country. And actually we cannot limit this conversation to any country specific discussion. It has to be a, a global agenda. And we just can't be having, like you said, a seminar or webinar one after the other. It's a question of actually evaluating whether we are going circular plus. It is also about, you know, not being this flatly uh, linear for such a long time. I mean, the, the, the take, make, dispose, that too has to come to an end. Uh, closing the loop is something that we all should be thinking of. How far sure. we've gone with the, um, with the conversation, I really don't know because there is no incentivizing. And in Bangladesh, we do so much of CMT business that uh, the value addition pitch is also not there. So we, we need will, a lot of self-correction. Yeah. We will come back to you, Dr. Hark. Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, we'll come back to Herc in terms of you know, the priorities and what do we need going forward. But thanks for uh, highlighting the importance of circularity plus, circularity plus and what people these days talk about as circular economy 2.0. So thanks a lot for putting that together. Uh, in your in your in your thoughts, if I can quickly go on to our uh, just about uh, uh, three thousand miles across to the east, uh, and and look at uh, Quan um, Quan uh, from Vietnam. Uh, Quan, you've heard uh, our earlier speakers from Kenya and from Bangladesh talk about you know the the current uh, sort of um, the, the environment in which circularity sits. Um, in in their own countries, um, you you've you've been a you've been a champion. You are working in this organization, this institution, which is uh, just trying to promote circular economy in the uh, in 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 the country. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts on the current policy environment in Vietnam, and to what extent uh, that is supportive or not. Over to you, Quan, for your three minutes. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rigrid, and hello everyone. Uh, thanks again for the organizer for inviting me to join the inter interesting panelists. Uh, yeah, so uh, come to uh, your question, I like to uh, share a bit about what uh, here in Vietnam we um, maybe start working or actually uh, developing a bit in a circular economy related. So basically, in Vietnam, uh, I think in like many other country we are in the time of facing with different uh, challenges, including uh, climate change, water pollution, soil depredations, and of course also the impact of climate change and so on. So um, yeah, there are way we know that the um, circular economy is a very uh, providing quite a very interesting approach and it's been like a solution for tackle different, uh, you know, I think multiple objective or you know, related to both environmental pollution and also economical developments. So in Vietnam, actually, we have been familiar a bit, not really with circular economy, but a kind of recycling, reusing, and uh, uh, in quite a long time ago, uh, especially come from agricultural practice. So you know, using uh, agricultural plants or um, um, other uh, activities. So we have like the VAC, which stand for garden and pond and portraits, kind of circularity at the farming scale. And also uh, in the past about 10, 15 years, we have been uh, working on, for example, on green growth development. So, and also some other related concept on uh, ecological industry and some others. So, I mean, this is another side, uh, another term of 
another definition, I mean, another perspective of circular economy, but people are a bit aware about that. But this was like most likely focusing on environmental protection rather the combined uh, environmental protection and economy uh, development. So, so, so that now so when circular economy come and uh, Viet, uh, yeah, the Vietnamese government is getting more and more interested in, in this and recently in the national political agenda. So we, especially with some other opportunities, especially when we come into the international, uh, I mean, uh, trades and like uh, the Euro Vietnam free trade agreements and also other uh, export um, market in the US and some others. So becoming people where that circular economy is getting more and more importance. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so now the circular economy recently had been put into the national uh, political agendas as different levels uh, from increase, especially in the coming five or 10 years, uh, a social economical development plan. The circular economy is one of the key uh, so-called solution that we're going to apply or to develop in order to, to support the country uh, developments, yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, of course, there are some opportunity for us also to do so, especially in terms of, uh, I mean, our, um, uh, because circular economy have like quite potential, especially in agriculture related practice, which is we are one of the top country in the world have been working in agricultural activities. But also Vietnam is one of the country have a really strong interest in transforming, especially in uh, digital transform uh, technology or transformations. So this is also a great opportunity that we can also include the advanced technology into the circular economy practice in terms of chasing uh, the products, chasing the disposal or how to optimize the production scale also, I mean, the production stage or also uh, the, 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 the chasing, which is, I think, very important, especially for for, for export uh, our uh, products into into uh, to the world, yeah. But of course, there are always there are a lot of challenges. I think we can teach a bit more. We'll, but of, yeah, we will come to the challenges in the in the next round, Quan. If that's okay with you. So thanks a lot for your uh, you know Thank your you. contribution, and I think uh, you really highlighted this very very important point that uh, you know how uh, how external factors also brings in and. In, in, infiltrates uh, you know national policy and you talked about the EU FTA uh, uh, as one of the perhaps triggers uh, in, in in creating this understanding and immersion for national uh, for the national development agenda about the importance of circular economy um, if I may uh, uh, move back to uh, uh, you know to uh, uh, to India and uh, and uh, request a colleague Divya from uh, UNEP India office. Uh, Divya, uh, uh, your thoughts on how the policy landscape is uh, evolving or has evolved in India broadly on, on circular economy. And of course, if you can talk about uh, you know, some of your organization's uh, uh, thoughts about uh, the textile sector, you know, either in India or generally speaking, uh, most welcome. So the floor is yours, you have three minutes. Yeah, thank you very much, Rajit. Um, textiles, of course, is is <clears throat> is, a, is a very important sector for the Indian economy, both from the perspective of contribution to GDP and exports, but also employment, as we know, and very similar to to um, Bangladesh, may, maybe not to that extent, but it's still an important sector for employment. Next, I think, only to agriculture, and so the development and modernization of, of the textiles and apparel industry has been a priority for the government. So I think. It has received a lot of policy emphasis and support. There are several ongoing schemes or uh, initiatives for, for infrastructure development, for textile parks, pollution control, um, skill development, uh, technological upgradation in general. And uh, the, the vision for the textiles and apparel uh, sector also speaks about positioning India globally as an eco-friendly hub across the textile and apparel value chain. So I think in, in terms of overall emphasis and policy framework, it is, it, it is there. Uh, but from the specific lens of sustainability and circularity, I would say that the predominant focus still now has been on 
meeting environmental standards. We can argue how well we've been able to do that, but the focus of policy has been on environmental standards and on improving the efficiency of resource use, particularly energy and water, with a focus on the small and medium uh, medium scale industry, which which is the uh, which has a lion's share in the in the sector. Um, having said that, I will add that the draft national resource efficiency policy of India mentions textiles as a priority sector, and in general, it covers the various interlinked aspects of efficiency and circularity, I think, quite comprehensively. So whether it is in terms of the vision, whether it is in terms of the institutional or sectoral coordination across ministry, state, industry organizations, experts, think tanks, to facilitate a life cycle thinking across sectors, resources, and stages of the product, whether it is in terms of um, identi identifying and generating the right data for the right indicators. And, and uh, Dr. Huck spoke about, you know, whether we are really looking at the right kind of uh, data. So, you know, some of these issues of data and indicators are, are captured in the, in the uh, draft policy. They're talking about setting targets, building capacity, talking about R&D, talking about enabling regulations, incentives, disincentives, uh, disclosure, information disclosure, market developing instruments. So I think, you know, it, the, the framework is pretty comprehensive when it comes to identifying the key elements for promoting circularity in general. It has also gone one step ahead, I would say, and indicated targets for select sectors, such as you know, it has um, recycling rates or public procurement targets for certain types of materials, such as uh, construction and demolition waste. But it hasn't gone to that level of detail for textiles. But I would imagine that once the policy is finalized, textiles will be one of the sectors to be taken up for detailed assessment. Because the, from the indications that we had, you know, you've been involved with the work um, that Niti Aayog has done. Niti Aayog, which is, which is the government's think tank and which has played a very important role in the, renewable, in the resource efficiency discourse in the country, has in fact commissioned a study on the efficiency and circularity in textiles. Um, so, um, so, so in short, I would say that, it, you know, that the importance of circularity in textiles and apparel has been picked up in the policy space. And we, we, will, we, we can hope that this will get translated into actionable policy agenda <clears throat> soon, especially once the draft resource efficiency policy gets approved. I would, <clears throat> I would agree with, with, with what Dr. Huck said that, you know, there, there, we, need, we need to take a much larger view of circularity that we have been taking. But I would also say that this uh, resource efficiency policy of the government is, is, is a good effort in that direction. We just have to see how it translates now in, into action. Thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Divya, and, and thanks for you know, uh, bringing in the element uh, of, uh, of the national policy. Of course, we'll come back to you uh, for your thoughts on you know, the federal structure that we have in India and how the national policy can uh, be uh, sort of uh, brought down into the uh, into the into the local uh, state level policy domains. Um, if I if we may uh, move over uh, to Sri Lanka and uh, and, and request uh, Sharika uh, Senanayake Sharika from Mass Holding. So Sharika, tell us a little bit about what's happening in Sri Lanka with all uh, with this whole uh, movement uh, that we that we are seeing in the region uh, on on circular economy. So over to you, Sharika, for your three minutes. You know. Sure, Richard. thank you and um, hi to everyone. Um, so here out in Sri Lanka, we um, have very similar challenges like I've already heard some of the speakers speak before and um, very much like Karen said, the first and biggest problem from a national level is from a waste perspective uh, for us to even start with uh, because uh, in terms of the sophistication of what we have, it's uh, challenging for us to, um, to be able to uh, have a formal way of which we can aggregate all of the waste. So that is fundamentally some of the challenges that we have. But from a policy perspective, actually the environmental ministry, and there's been a lot of support from um, other public and private uh, ministries to come and set up certain policies. So two such policy uh, policy frameworks, which are were due to be implemented, but slightly delayed that I can just talk to you a little bit about 
was um, actually the extended producer responsibility, which was a public private partnership that the government was specifically looking at putting in place to manage plastic waste. Um, and this was something that we um, started to talk about with a lot of um, uh, discussion with the private sector and the government. And um, this started in 2018, expected for implementation in 2020. So this policy came about when at first the government was thinking that they couldn't handle the plastic waste. So they were looking at bans of certain types of plastic. And then from the industry, they heard that banning a whole type of plastic is not really going to sort the problem. So what we wanted to do was make sure that there was a producer responsibility, that there was the polluter pay sort of model that came into play. So the expected policy framework was supposed to be handed in September 2020 to the government. Uh, to go into uh, implementation and cabinet approval. So we are really on the cusp of that extended producer responsibility. The other thing we see at a national level is uh, a sustainable um, consumption and production in Sri Lanka that uh, we are trying to put the framework in. Uh, it was uh, initially set up for all the uh, SDGs that we had committed to do and also to look at sectorial wise how they would be able to implement this and some of those policies would be able to then impact um, how circularity would become far more um, uh, clear for, for each of the industries. So I think as a priority, our government looked at the tea, dairy and rice industry of Hadi to start off in putting those uh, consumption and practices in place. But um, definitely there is a lot of support uh, that we see for other industries also coming up. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sharika, for your uh, very pointed intervention. And, and it's very heartening to see uh, the, the the extended producer responsibility framework being developed for for plastics. In fact, in in some countries, there is a talk about uh, you know using it also for the textile sector. And we'll, we'll come to that. Um, let, let let us go over now to uh, our friend from uh, Shinji, uh, uh, Tanzania, uh, Antoinette. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, you know, your your work in the region. About you know what are some of the um, you know the developments related to policy that you are seeing uh, you know, broadly, or specifically if you can talk about the the textile the apparel and textile sector. Uh, in the region that you uh, represent. So the floor is yours, uh, Internet. Uh, thank you, Rajat, and good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, so basically, the, most of the work that we do is around um, looking at industrial development and the development of in, uh, sustainable industries. And as I'm saying, we take a very long, we try and take a long outlook into making that systemic change or that growth happen. So, and, you know, our program tries to take a 10 to 15 year horizon and understand what will this industry look like in 10, 15 years and where the opportunities for East Africa. Now, what's really interesting about the East African context, and I'm speaking now about the countries where we're most active in, which is Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, and to a little extent, Ethiopia, is that the textile and apparel sectors are all high uh, priority sectors for all the governments in the region. Even under the EAC association, textile and apparel is a, is a key industry that is meant to drive growth, uh, industrialization and job creation in the region. And the government really plays that role of trying to drive, you know, once you position the sector as a priority sector, it's around building and providing the necessary enabling environment to make that growth happen. As Karen already mentioned, the industry here is still quite small. So as I'm saying, we see a real opportunity for governments now as they're setting up their roadmaps of how this change is meant to happen to look at where the technology and the global movements are and to really position circularity and sustainable production at the heart of the, the, the growth of the sector. Um, we have a lot of manufacturers here that come from South Asia, so I think it's also really interesting to have this conversation and to hear my colleagues from you know, the fellow panelists from other from other ecosystems. And for, I think most of the time, the focus has really been on production and producing more and being able to capture more markets, not just for export, uh, which 
I think East Africa has a big opportunity for, but also for the domestic market. As we know, uh, Africa is going to be the biggest consumer region in the next 10 years. So, and, and I think that, you know, whilst there's this whole idea about production and, you know, reviving primary production, looking at how you link it up with agriculture, it's still at very early stages to start thinking about circularity. I mean, most of the governments are probably going to be the biggest investors in the sector in terms of infrastructure um, and also the type of concessions that they will give manufacturers. And it would be good to say, actually see them embed some sort of circularity in the process. Because now the technology that is available internationally or in a lot of think tanks that are developing the technology around the sector has actually become cheaper. And in East Africa, we have a situation where tourism and natural resources are also a big part of the economic uh, GDP input, um, and those need to be safeguarded. So what we've seen in the likes of Ethiopia is a real deliberate effort and the decision to say, if we're going to build industrial park, let them be green enough, good enough, you know, with the right type of level of technology, renewable energy. But when you specifically speak to manufacturers, and they say, you know, I want to go solar and I want to uh, put in a lot of solar panels on my factory, but where do I get the input to, to change my batteries when they get older? So you have to think not just beyond what's happening on the textile manufacturing phase, but also the, the supporting services that come around that. I think at this point in time, most of the EAC uh, countries have you know, they have the right environmental processes in place. Some of them need to be upgraded, especially looking at you know, the, the type of toxicity that you can allow in the water, um, how waste is treated. But there is a lot around waste management and environmental safeguarding. What is missing, I think, is around you know, what, uh, like um, Dr. Hart said, is closing that loop. Because you, know, you, you are going to produce a lot of things. You can put all the right uh, sustainable elements at the beginning of the production process, but those same clothes that you're producing today and that you're making are going to come back in the secondhand clothing or as waste or as actually used clothing in your own market. What happens to those? So there is an initiative I understand now, especially in Kenya, of um, you know starting around looking at um, extended producer responsibility. But that is really looking at plastics, metals, I think building and construction to some extent. But textile and apparel hasn't really come into that. And the question is maybe the industry is too small, but maybe also the industry is really focused on growth more. And, and I think, um, you know, as, as the governments now, a lot, a lot of the government uh, roadmaps are coming to an end 2020, 2021, 22. So it is the hope of Misingi that, you know, we can support these governments to build circularity into the next five year or 10 year roadmaps. But then also to try and identify the type of technologies that can help that, that can make that work and that can actually be affordable and usable in East Africa. Not everything is possible here. Our cost of electricity is high, the infrastructure is difficult, and there's a lot of fragmentation at an institution level. So a lot of the work I think will also be around linking up the different actors and really, you know, mapping out the full value chain and then closing the loop. And as investments yeah. happen, not just investing in production, but also investing in the waste management and recycling. Oh, sure. thanks a lot, um, Antoinette. I think you you all you raised uh, you know again uh, a number of issues, and one of the uh, one of the important issues you raised, which your uh, uh, sort of I think Quan also talked about, was in terms of the timing and the triggers uh, for introducing circular economy into the policy framework. So so that's a very very important point, uh, especially for all the advocates uh, of circular economy. Uh, le le let me quickly move on to our last, uh, uh, but not the least, um, uh, panelist um, uh, from the East Africa Business Council. And we have uh, Ms. Uh, Miriam Mondosha. Uh, uh, Miriam, uh, thanks a lot for joining the panel. And uh, we understand uh, that, that Dr. Atuki is uh, is not able to join us. So if you can if you can share your thoughts uh, on behalf of uh, Dr. Matuki in terms of what are some of the developments that you see in the region. So Miriam, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and apologies uh, for uh, not being able to switch my video. I'm still uh, working um, on it. Yeah. 
for yes for uh, i think uh, for the east african context uh, a lot of, has been said already uh, from uh, colleagues from um, singi and also um karin uh, but i think it is uh, worth uh, noting that uh, the textile and apparel uh, 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 before independence uh, used to uh, fare very well relatively uh, to uh, right now but uh, despite its collapse uh, recent years we've seen uh, a convergence the most east african countries uh, in terms of uh, prioritizing it as uh, one of the drivers of, of our economies i think if you look at uh, all the development uh, plans for all the east african countries you'll see uh, uh, it being prioritized a lot and also we've seen a lot of uh, divergence in terms of uh, the fiscal incentives that are being put in place uh, to uh, really uh, grow uh, this sector. But I think as uh, most people have, have said, I think that there's still an enormous uh, potential uh, in terms of uh, developing this sector uh, to, to uh, be integrated into uh, the green and uh, circular economy. We've seen a lot of uh, countries, especially Rwanda, uh, being at the forefront uh, in driving uh, this, but uh, other East African countries, uh, say Kenya and uh, Tanzania, have also been seen uh, putting some measures in terms of uh, uh, getting rid of uh, plastic bags. Uh, we've seen a lot of measures um, in that, but uh, in terms of the policy thinking, I think uh, there's still room uh, for it. And uh, what we should be focusing on, I think uh, the policymakers in East Africa are still not yet convinced on uh, the economic rationale uh, for this. So I think uh, it is, it is uh, within us as uh, stakeholders in, uh, in this sector to uh, put the economic rationale for the private sector and also for, for the government in terms of uh, adopting a, a secular economy. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Miriam. Uh, the East African uh, Business Council also plays a very, very important role in engaging with the East African community. Um, and uh, therefore, perhaps, uh, you know, our, our hope uh, is also that at some point of time, uh, the East African community can also be influenced to look at uh, a circular economy uh, policy at the regional level, which, uh, and there are several other important uh, economic areas that the African community has taken a lead in developing regional policies so that there is consistency uh, among and within the, the five members of the East African community. So I think that's also another um, probably an area uh, where you know, the East African business community can uh, sort of look at and we'll probably come to this question in the, in the next round. Um, now, now that we've completed the first round, uh, we would like to sort of, you know, go back to our panelists uh, with our question. And I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm conscious of the time, and I'd like to combine, if that's okay, with you, Somatish, um, the second and the third question, which is really about um, now that we know the policy environment, we have some idea of what are some of the issues and the challenges. What are some of the uh, what are some of the key priorities for uh, each each one of us in each of these countries in terms of the policy innovation going forward. What are some of the, you know, and if you can uh, make your uh, interventions uh, pointed, I think that will that will really be helpful uh, for all of us. Um, and, and, you know, if you can talk about maybe two or three uh, areas uh, in the short term, uh, medium term, or in long term, whichever you feel, of what are some of the key um, policy interventions that are required in order to uh, sort of uh, take the, uh, the the take the the, the conversation uh, uh, on 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 circular economy, which is happening at different levels, uh, really to bring it bring it down to uh, specific action. So, what are some of the according to each one of you? What are some of the two or three? Uh, specific policy interventions that are required in your country to move into action and 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 to act, um, as we said earlier, uh, uh, taking into consideration that it can't be business as usual and the fact that we need to act fast 
and act soon. So if I can start with uh, Dr. Subana Huff, please. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So um, I'll just be very brief. The, there are key challenges that we face uh, in our sector at this point, uh, and that's, of course, the informal waste management. Uh, so we need to identify what are the key challenges. So informal waste management is one. So we want to kind of give a structure to that. The second is uh, there's no clear policy guidelines for circular economy, um, yeah, which would be coupled with strong business case. So we need to also uh, connect the dots. And uh, circular economy also follows a different pathway, which is not properly addressed by the finance institutions. So we also need to link it. Um, if we talk about that, I can just tell you very quickly what we've done so far, like we've adopted, we've drafted, sorry, our, our industrial water use policy that touches uh, the principle of circular economy. We have drafted the green economic zones guideline for our uh, Bangladesh economic zone authority. And that also incorporates the CE principles and BGME was also involved with the technical uh, inputs. And uh, if you talk about what BGMEA um, has done, well, we have been um, involved in uh, a kickoff program on, on, you know, what could we done? What could we, we have done? We have um, already partnered with Global Fashion Agenda, Reverse Resources, which is basically an Estonian partnership, a startup. We have endorsed and also contributed to the MFC, the Making Fa Fashion Circular. Um, of, of uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So no matter what, we are still going ahead with doing what we want to do. What is a wish list for us is of course the sector diversification. There's a huge business uh, in, in circular economy. So we feel that you know there's almost a $4 billion uh, worth economy which awaits us if we, um, we, it, if, if we can actually address our total volume of uh, annual leftovers of 400,000 tons. And if these leftovers can actually be recycled into making new yarns and, and used in remanufacturing garments, this could uh, give birth to a completely uh, new business for us. So uh, we want to concentrate on PSF because it has emerged as the fastest growing manufactured fibers. And we are hoping that, you know, it, since it is widely used in textile, automatic, and, and uh, furniture industries. Um, this is, uh, this is a PSF is, is one area we really want to focus on uh, because the market current market size of PSF is only $24 billion. It will grow to around 35. So we feel that these are places uh, where we need to concentrate on and uh, move forward. Thank okay. you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Huck, for your uh, pointed intervention. Can we uh, can I ask uh, Sharika to come in next? Sharika, your thoughts on what are the key priorities, uh, two to three, four priorities for, for Sri Lanka to really uh, you know, transform uh, the discussion uh, into action going forward? Sure, thanks, yeah. So I think um, if I was just, just to talk about the three top priorities, um, I would say current uh, uh, we require some of the tools uh, for um, understanding um, how to, uh, for an understanding and transparency of what exactly is happening. I think that's also linked to what you said in terms of a standard understanding also of what circularity means so that we all get onto the same playing field. So that is one major area. And I think an easy intervention that we can do in a very short term because these tools are being developed. It's just about having us under, uh, implementing them. Uh, the next uh, big area, I think, in terms of opportunity is around the innovation side. Uh, right now, we've spent the last um, three years, if I was to talk about a textile perspective, finding out with things like fibers, uh, uh, rejuvenated fibers, et cetera, do they work? Do they give you the same performance? And, and it does. And we've proven this with uh, recycled polyester, with recycled yarn, yarn being made out of pet waste, yarn being made out of fishing net. And we know that we can give you the same quality if we keep, and we don't have to keep back going to 100% virgin. So I think it's really important that the whole innovation and investment and in R&D happens in this to make it from what might be a lab project to commercializing this at a large scale. And then making sure that there is an intervention and an in, uh, incentive 
that we would be able to manage the price points because like we talked about it there right. are two things either people can pay us more or we can figure out how to manufacture this at the same rate or lower um in in how we can do it so for me i would say those would be the top three priorities sure. for us to get this whole system going great thanks a lot sharika uh, karen uh, your thoughts on the priorities going forward yeah thanks i think we're quite aligned i'm quite aligned with uh, sharika in this uh, in this light i just want to respond very quickly also there's a question of whether the extended producer responsibility is a, a step in the right direction. And in Kenya at the moment, we're formulating as um, Antoinette also mentioned, we're coming to the end of the cycle. So there's a lot of opportunity to redefine policies. And for instance, the new waste management bill has, come, has reached parliament. So it needs to be approved, but there was space to incorporate circular economy um, ideas, models uh, and incentives. So to be short, in the EPR, what is now proposed is actually that the EPR in Kenya would be applicable to 17 waste streams, of which also textile and fabrics are is one. Um, yes, the discussion, I want to just highlight, like waste is the first thing. Why? Because waste, it's only the last part of the cycle of, of circular economy. It's actually not what is going to solve anything. We can't recycle our way out of this mess. But because it displays the problem so in such a big uh, um, uh, picture, uh, that's where we start the conversation. And that's okay. I mean, we have to start somewhere. The EPR starts in Kenya to be a voluntary, uh, but very soon a mandatory um, uh, thing. And therefore there is being um, developed in the Kenyan Association for Manufacturers, the PRO, so a producer responsibility organization under which you get all the different extended producer responsibility uh, uh, streams. Now, yes, there is also a start then putting levies and making sure that you get all your waste, all your materials actually, recover them from uh, landfill and the environment in general. And yes, one aspect is to formalize the informal sector. And that's happening at, as we speak. It's happening more and more because we don't have a proper infrastructure. So that's where the conversation starts and the change starts to happen. But what we hope to see and what you actually need to encourage, and I agree with Sharika, is that because that EPR imposes a responsibility to the producers, the producer will start thinking whether this is the right way to actually tackle their waste. And what we see now is that, for instance, bigger companies and corporates are thinking like a, like a Lush in, in the UK, which has naked soaps and, and stuff like that. The packaged material they, start, they keep on using, they start recycling it themselves. Because you don't know exactly what kind of, in terms of recycling, you need to know what kind of materials you have. The same for textile. It's still very hard to recycle it. And therefore, you need to um, push innovations and incentives. So if a producer knows what kind of pure textile and fiber goes into his products, it's much easier to recover the material as a 100% input for the next cycle. If you don't do that, if you don't redesign and if you don't think about the quality of your produce, then recycling you know, is really the end of a story and it's never going to be part of closing the loop. Um, so for us, yeah. EPR is one big thing. Um, and the last thing I want to highlight is we have to create new values because we talk about a circular plus. The circular economy is a system change. It changes everything. That's why it's such an elaborate conversation. Um, but we need to also stop using the word growth. Growth doesn't belong to a circular economy. We have to thrive. So we have to create new value systems. If we don't do that, we see it also in Kenya, you, you make briquettes from waste um, to, for, for an alternative cooking fuel. Um, but the tree, to cut down a tree is still cheaper. How is that possible? How is it possible that we don't change our values? How can you have a deforestation rate that is against all odds? And it's, it's really frightening, but yet a waste recycler that makes briquettes can't compete with a tree you do something wrong yeah. we have to create a new value set you can't sure. value solutions with old value uh, sets 
So that is Thanks. instrumental mm -hmm. for the circular economy. We really need to change the system. Great. No, thanks for that. I think, you know, uh, the, the, the importance of value systems and uh, uh, the, the idea of, of, uh, of systems thinking is uh, fundamental to uh, transition to circular economy. So thanks a lot for that. Uh, Antoinette, uh, your three minutes about uh, priorities, uh, two to three priorities that you see. Uh, do, you, do you agree with Karen about some of the things that you said or are there additional elements uh, uh, that you feel that you'd like to talk about. So yours, please. Yeah, so I mean, I, I totally agree with Karen and I, and I agree with her that waste is a good place to start because it's a problem we have right now um, and, and needs to be addressed. And I think it's that, it's that challenge of having to manage so many moving parts all at the same time. It's not going to be a linear sort of progress, um, more like a jungle gym to borrow um, someone else's term. But I think the one thing that I, I, is very close to our, our heart is data. And, and I think um, my colleague from the ABC mentioned that, that we don't, a lot of these, there's a lot of unknowns in the chain. Um, you know, as Ruban also, my do, Dr. Hugh also said, you know, you have raw materials that, that are finished good that could come in to be recycled. We don't know how much is that. You look at the output from any factory in terms of waste and how they use it. Do we have a good understanding of what, what, what is there? And in terms of creating that business model and showing the value of actually, you know, taking a cyclical outlook. If you think around the cotton to fashion value chain, for if you're starting to plant new fabric in order to make new clothes, you are always adding to the, to the problem instead of thinking, can part of that cotton be actually uh, taken back from used or already used uh, cotton material? Can that be sorted? Where, where, what are the opportunities there? And to actually quantify the, the financial value of that. So I think there is a lot of misconceptions that you know being green is expensive. And I heard this a lot of the times in the in this um, in this uh, conference is that you know good business in the future it has to be green business. We are at a point right now in the world where we can no longer think about manufacturing or um, you know, creation or growth in the old ways. Uh, and the COVID pandemic has actually put that at the center. I remember when we were speaking around the, the you know, uh, factories pivoting to make PPE, the second question is disposing of PPE safely. But then you're putting in all this additional new plastic, what happens to that? Is there, is there a way instead of just thinking about disposing of how to reuse, remake, instead of trying to think about setting up a refinery to, 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 to produce raw material. And I think a lot of that will need to have some sort of information input. And then the next thing is to reward good behavior. So I know there is a gap um, in terms of where our manufacturers are now and where the global standards could be, but can we build a situation to understand those gaps and then work towards a way to fill those gaps. It's not going to be immediate. Um, I'm not a, you know, we're not fans of like a big stick approach of, you know, enforce and enforce everybody, but create a platform where the industry and public sector can co-create that direction, oh. but accept the civicality has to be a part of it. Thank you. Sure, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you raised the, the, the issue of uh, shared responsibility and the importance of uh, stakeholders coming together through through that kind of a multi-stakeholder platform. It's very, very critical. Uh, it can't be any singular entity's responsibility. I think that's a mistake that uh, we've done, uh, you know, while looking at uh, uh, transformations, we've thought that, you know, it's, it's the responsibility of the supplier or it's the responsibility of the buyer. We haven't really looked at the entire system. Uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, from our own experience also, uh, the idea of, uh, looking at uh, value chains uh, and not really looking at supply chains um, and, and being trans, trans, transactional in our thinking um, is, is a possibility. So thanks uh, a lot, Antoinette, uh, for you know highlighting that. Uh, Kwan, uh, if I may turn over to you for your thoughts on what are those two, three uh, sort of uh, priorities for Vietnam, uh, and and even I mean you can even talk about uh, uh, the CLV region if you wish. Um, uh, the Greater Mekong region as well, but uh, tell us a little bit about uh, you know your thoughts on, uh, on 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 what do you see going forward as some of the critical areas. So, three minutes uh, quickly, Quan. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Rizit. 
Yeah, I am quite um, agree with what have been previous uh, panelists uh, have been discussed. Uh, in, I mean, yeah. So, but just some few additional ideas from my side, especially from the Vietnamese context. Yeah, I think a parting, for example, uh, yeah, some colleagues mentioned about the the waste as one of uh, 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 key to target areas. So, I just want to add a bit, but uh, yeah, waste is very important, but I mean, when we look at the way it's not on, uh, it seems that we are more focusing on environmental issues, but I think at the same time, we may also look at some others like um, uh, political agenda, I mean, national and international agenda so that we can convey some more resources to, to work together, not only to look at the waste, but also like uh, climate change or renewable energy, and also some other, I mean, again, as a very interesting uh, uh, agenda on uh, digital transformation related. So, I mean, when we put it all together, of course, it's very, uh, very difficult because it's uh, crossing different uh, the, uh, disciplines, also different sector. Uh, but I mean, again, if we are just focused on selected sector, it's difficult to, to really, um, to, to link or to close really the loops so when we put all together, it could be a very, I mean, again, a very good um, uh, solution, but of course, very ch uh, challenged uh, for that. Um, and uh, for Vietnam, I think we are happy, I mentioned already, I think there are quite potential sectors that we are be working on, especially on agriculture uh, productions and a bit also on uh, uh, renewable energy. We just recently the renewable energy is very one of the fastest growing industry in Vietnam. We become like uh, um, top country in Southeast Asia in renewable energy. But uh, because this this one becomes successful because of the uh, um, models where we have uh, the something like the governments or industry uh, partnership um, uh, models. So how we can develop a kind of win-win or win-win-win. A solution, I think, could be a one of very important entry points uh, for uh, circular economy or maybe some other. So I believe, like one mentioned about how to develop a good design business models uh, to to link different sectors to different actors in in the network is one of the uh, key entry point uh, for uh, for the coming years. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Paul. I think again you talked about uh, you know the, the, the having a very uh, holistic and a systems approach, and also highlighted the importance of renewable energy. And I'm I'm sure Karen would be very happy to sort of have a chat with you offline because of the fact that she talked about the you know the importance of uh, electricity and the cost of electricity. So does renewable energy provide an opportunity for bringing down those costs, for example? So. Uh, very interesting. We are going. We are going to get into the last uh, round, uh, and uh, you know, very very quickly, we'll talk about. We'll give you about 30 seconds each one of you to talk about one area that you feel that you could learn from any of the other um, uh, uh, panelists that you've heard, and I'll and and we'll do it at random. But before that, our last speaker on this round, uh, Divya, uh, over to you about your uh, thoughts on you know some of the actions. Uh, and the priorities, maybe two to three for uh, for India. Yeah, Again, thanks, Richard. There is, uh, I think most of it has been covered, so I'll do this very quickly. I think there are four major issues in my view. One, uh, and we've spoken about this, the need to consolidate scientific, science and evidence and understanding of circularity and hotspots in the value chain, as well as the roles and responsibilities of different actors. I think that understanding is very important rather than this sort of unstructured approach to circularity that, that we are seeing. I think second, policy frameworks should ensure, should enable circularity to become a business proposition in addition to being an ethical consideration, which it is now. And, and this will require policy change that, that makes circularity profitable and linearity unprofitable rather than the other way around. Uh, I'm not getting into what specific policy instruments um, can can do so because I think I mean both because of time and because I think the panel here is is very well versed with these issues. I think the third issue um, that policy must prioritize is 
is to, to ensure that circularity is seen as more than just recycling and waste management. And it also includes other dimensions, such as redesigning and, and regenerating natural ecosystems. And, and all of this, I think, you know, requires the right kinds of incentives, disincentives, um, infrastructure for reverse logistics, for instance, R&D, traceability, transparency, you know, all these things that have been spoken about. But let me just highlight two issues here in terms of policy. One, I think we, apart from these sector-specific policy issues, it is, it is imperative for us to revisit resource pricing more generally. You know, what, what should be the price of water? What should be the price of, um, you know, waste disposal? So I think it's, it's important that we, we get our pricing right. There's been a discussion on changing value system. I think that's absolutely essential at an economy level and not just for any one sector. And the second policy instrument, which we've heard a lot about and which, which is important in, for, to create market is that of sustainable public procurement. I think that's, that's an important area for India. Um, there is a task force in the Ministry of Finance on SPP. Um, there is, I think, agreement that SPP is the way forward to push, to push sustainability. But I think there are still a lot of gaps in, 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 in terms of understanding how this is to be implemented in terms of which parameters should be considered, how deep in the value chain must these parameters go, um, and assessing whether markets are ready. And you know, how do you assess market readiness? So I think these kinds of issues, when it comes to ensuring that, that policy both makes uh, business sense or, or enables circularity to make business sense, and to go beyond recycling. And I think the last point I want to very quickly highlight is the importance of the small and medium-sized enterprise in the transition to a circularity. I think that will be an absolute priority for a country like India. Um, and, and here, I think the, the issues of capacity building, financial mechanisms, technology support, I think all this will be required, but I think at the back of uh, the, you know, uh, the backbone, I would say, of policy will still be how do you make this sector competitive? And, and I think we will have to weave uh, the imperatives of circularity in the competitiveness of the SMEs. And that is really the policy challenge that we have to grapple with when it comes to textiles in India, I would say. Thanks. Great. Thanks a lot, Divya. I think you, you know, you've put so many dots on the horizon and, you know, it's, I think, you know, there's a complex cobweb running across how do you sort of uh, build those relationships between sustainable public procurement on one side and uh, getting the SMEs and not losing out the SMEs into this uh, in, as we move on to this movement uh, or go on to this movement on circular economy. So thanks a lot for that. Um, uh, Somantish, I'm going to ask you if we can have maybe some questions uh, for about uh, five minutes. I think there are a few questions that we received. But if I, if we can maybe uh, allocate about, uh, you know, take about two to three questions, and I'll just, uh, you know, take quickly, um, ask the panelists uh, for those questions, if that's okay. Absolutely, absolutely, Richard. Okay, thanks. Uh, very, very quickly now to the quiz. Uh, uh, you know, which thirty seconds uh, and not any more time. I mean, if you can do fifteen seconds, even better. Uh, uh, Antoinette. What is that one thing that you've learned from any of the other panelists that uh, excites you to do something uh, and look at that and maybe catch up with that uh, person and see if you can apply it in your region? Oh, that's really difficult. I've heard so much, which is so amazing. Um, but quiz. I think, I think the, the best thing is the platform for discourse. And I'm really liking what I saw from the Bangladesh side and Sri Lanka that you have industry working with government to drive policy. And I think that's one thing that we, we, we have to see a lot more in East Africa at a, at a national and also at a regional level. Sure. Thanks. Um, Juan? Yeah, thank you very much, Regis. Uh, and yeah, of course, I also learned a lot uh, from the, the panelists and uh, I am quite interested in uh, the, I think they are quite similar to, um, uh, problem and also things that happening in some our uh, country, um, friends countries. Yeah, and um, yeah, so some of topic um, uh, I would like to, I mean, I also very interested in is especially how to link the circular economy and, and the livelihoods and also the small and right. medium enterprise. I think it's uh, the circular economy should, have, should be based from a very grassroots or from uh, 
maybe no. like bottom of uh, of course so i think sorry 30 seconds and you made your point I, i'm sorry I, i'll be i'll be ruthless here now uh sharika 30 seconds hi so i think what was most thought provoking for me is i think when we look at circular economy here it's very environmentally heavy so for me i like the approach that bangladesh is taking very much on a livelihood to social perspective that really needs to be integrated also into that whole circular piece okay great uh, that brings us to bangladesh dr hak over to you hi um, i think uh, everybody has talked about the extended um, producer responsibility i think that's something that we could uh, take forward so that because you know it would enhance the I see business case and also at the same time localizing solutions and innovation amongst the south so bangladesh yeah. india sri lanka can come to it together that's it thank you very Brilliant. much thanks a lot okay uh, karen yeah i'm also very interested in um the countries that actually have a, a massive workforce in the textile and apparel um to see how you can convert that because on the short term that would people would panic about loss of jobs so how do you transition with that amount of workforce already in which is which is smaller in kenya so we could refocus and we could reinvent actually this industry um, but if you have to transform the industry i i i think it's very very interesting to learn from from countries like india from bangladesh from sri lanka how you can do that best so how can you go into different business models that actually still guarantee like repair reuse but also recovering materials a different way of production um th that give better job of uh, possibilities or actually better paid jobs uh, better balance but also healthier jobs but still you have to transform so many jobs so i'm really interested in how the south would tackle that the other side of the south but this <laughs> yeah thanks a lot uh, divya your 30 seconds yeah i would say the unpacking of epr is is one big issue that we need to learn from each other on in, in such a diffuse sort of a market with so many small stakeholders how do you ensure that and i think the second issue would be would be uh, getting the right data because if you can't measure it you you can't manage it so i think epr and data would be the the big two things that we can learn from each other on great thanks a lot uh, somatish we seem to have lost our colleague from the east africa community uh, so i'm not sure if uh, we can get them to part of this uh, last but uh, yeah i think uh, i think we've covered everything uh, all the questions all the goals you gave us somatish uh, i don't know if you are happy with what uh, you've got here but i think i'm i'm really uh, i was really happy and fascinated to be part of this conversation and i hope and i really uh, really do that uh, this is the beginning of a of a conversation um in the production centers of the world you know we are the we are the ones which uh, which which produce for the world and uh, if we want to sort of uh, uh, develop a world which is uh, which integrates circularity i think we all have to start uh, you know coming out of our comfort zone as i said at the outset and and start to doing things uh, differently we have about 5 minutes somatish do you think we should take a few questions um, So there was one question uh, which was about green textiles uh, karen uh, very quickly in 30 seconds can you talk about uh, your your thoughts about green textile in kenya and you mentioned about that so there was a question about what do you mean about uh, what do you what is green textiles and how do you develop that and your your experiences there so over to you karen yeah so for, firstly in uh, producing uh, organic organically grown uh, textiles like cotton for instance that is one part of looking at green production um so how do you produce that and uh, there's a lot of uh, new technology in smart agriculture basically which we can apply in Kenya that will encourage green uh, production of of um, materials but then obviously we also have the synthetic uh, produce so if you look at the green um uh, textiles you have to look at how can we 
later on break down the fibers and how are they being produced. And, and there the dye process comes into place, which is still very polluting and it should not, it doesn't have to be polluting. We have the technologies now to have actually a non-polluting a non-toxic uh, dyeing technology. So that's one. And the other thing is that we combine all types of fibers. So we mix a lot of cottons with synthetic materials and that will um, then lead to almost impossible uh, breakdown of fibers to fibers again. Although the innovations for, for green technologies on that are also in the make, which are both mechanically, but they're not 100% guaranteed that that works. Right. And they are chemically. So, so those are aspects of how to produce green textile. Sure, sure. Thank you a lot, uh, Karen. Uh, Divya, there was also a question about where is the consumer in all this? You know, we haven't talked too much about the uh, demand side, or have we? Um, can you share your thoughts on that? Um, absolutely. I think the final trigger will have to be the markets and and the consumer. And at uh, UNEP, if I can quickly say, we're we're working to create awareness, you know, through our through our influencers, through our ambassadors, on the need to move towards slow fashion, a long life garments. But I think, I mean, all that is very well. But we also need to uh, understand the reality of a very large population base, which which is not, um, you know, able to afford that those niche products, because these products are still niche and in terms of the, the price margins, there is still a difference. So I think um, while it is okay for us to, you know, continue our advocacy and outreach to, you know, to um, uh, get more and more consumers on board through also transparency and traceability systems, you know, tagging of garments so that we can trace their history. I think all those, uh, those systems of information disclosure are absolutely essential. But I think yeah. unless we are able to sort of somehow take this whole movement to the to the masses, if I can put it crudely, um, we are not going to see the kind of scale we want to. So I think the yeah. you know systems need to change rather than um, targeting a, a certain and, of uh, consumers. Sorry, thanks, thanks, Vivia, for that. Uh, Sharika, I'm going to put you in the spot. A consumer is going to make, are going to are going to demand less. Uh, what implication will it have on the industry, uh, especially in countries like ours, where we have people's job to save? Well, I mean, I don't think, um, I think the challenge for us is even if the uh, consumer demands less, I think as we go into slow fashion, as they start um, wanting to respect what they're buying and that they can use it longer, I think we would also like to go into where we're able to make more sustainable margins right now. And we would like to use a product and quality that would have, you know, that you can use for much longer. So I think the business model might change. Um, and when it comes to the impact on labor, I think that as we are getting more sophisticated in the types of uh, fabrics, yarns, et cetera, if we can create those industries, which we don't currently have near shore within right. our island, um, I think it's just a matter of giving them more opportunities around creating that here. So, I mean. Great, thanks, thanks, Sharika. And I'm going to turn it over to Somatish because I know that we have about 35 seconds to go before two. So over to you, Somatish. No, I, I mean, thank you so much, Rijit. I think it was a fantastic, uh, you know, discussion and thank you all uh, the speakers just want to kind of leave a few comments uh, you know on uh, uh, you know based on what we discussed and just kind of uh, highlight that uh, uh, you know as dr huck mentioned about this term circular plus uh, it was uh, ironic because uh, we uh, as eif are working on a project uh, called circular plus supported by the loudest foundation we are basically working uh, to through a working group uh, approach to develop uh, inclusive circular business models and pilot them. So that's that's something that was really interesting to hear from her. Uh, responding to something that Sharika mentioned in terms of you know uh, creating this common vision framework for action, some of you who would have uh, may have actually heard in our plenary, opening plenary session uh, today that we uh, today we launched a multi multi-year uh, <clears throat> industry-wide flagship program through a collaboration between GIZ fashion retail and CIF to build a common vision framework for action and uh, building a business case for circular textile and apparel industry. 
so i think it was uh, really uh, good to see that you know i think there are already things that uh, bind us there are certain uh, aspects where there are commonalities and for each of the countries to learn learn from learn to each learn from each other and uh, i think this the discussion was just brilliant uh, so thank you so much again and hope uh, you guys continue with us today uh, we have a very interesting session right now uh, called better than plastic where we are showcasing sustainable alternatives to single use plastic packaging for the textile sector thank you once again thank you so much Bye -bye.